June 30, 2023. This is your weekly Room Now podcast. Hi, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. This week, we have new FDA actions, more paradoxical reactions, and scleroderma through thick and thin. And what does that mean? Let's start with some FDA actions. The FDA has approved on yet another drug. Actually, there's a second drug approved for alopecia areata. This is Pfizer's product called Ritalcitinib. It's approved for adults and adolescents over the age of 12 with severe alopecia um, areata. And this is based on a recently published large trial, the Allegro trial in Lancet. Now it joins uh, baricitinib as the other drug approved uh, for alopecia areata. I, again, I've used these drugs with really great success uh, for mainly alopecia universalis. Those are the ones I get referred. Um, but I've seen a few with alopecia areata and they do really well with the jack and hammer. So I expect this to continue. There was another recent analysis, a meta-analysis of what looks like seven trials and almost 2,000 patients showed that that using jack inhibitors give you a five-fold increase odds of 50% hair regrowth and an eight-fold increase odds of 90% improvement when compared to head-to-head against placebo. Turns out that there are a few trials that look at, most of these trials are oral JAK inhibitors, but there's a few looking at topical JAK inhibitors, which turns out topical JAK inhibitors really are only equal to placebo whereas the orals seem to work really, really well. The FDA has made another decision to delay its decision on bimikizumab. This is UCB's IL-17A and F inhibitor, uh, slated for approval at the end of June for uh, severe, moderate severe psoriasis. As you know, there are trials done in psoriatic arthritis, but we have to wait on psoriasis first. Uh, again, there was a manufacturing delay earlier this year, um, and now things are back on track, but the FDA is not yet ready. They haven't said when they're, they're going to make their decision, but they pushed this back another quarter. without. But there seems to be no safety signals or efficacy worries here. It's just that they need more time, I believe, to actually do the analysis. But again, if this is to happen, it would be at the sometime in the third quarter of 2023, which we're now entering. Um, another uh, new drug that's not yet approved, Mirakizumab, is another anti-IL-23 monoclonal antibody. Really um, got a good splash this week with a very effective phase two trial in ulcerative colitis patients. It was better than placebo at remission rates. Um, these are patients who went in on the drug. Those who had remission at week 12, it was 24%. Then were re-randomized to either placebo or Mirakizumab. And again, they did better than placebo with um, 50 versus 25% in maintaining remission. Um, This drug is not yet FDA approved. This is Lilly's drug. Um, They received a complete complete response letter over manufacturing issues some two months ago in April. Um, When that gets cleared up and with data like this, hopefully they'll get good news in the near future. Uh, We've talked in the past about paradoxical reactions with TNF inhibitors, and you're well aware This is mostly psoriasis. We have two recent studies um, uh, in adults and in kids. The Mayo study was 103 patients of kids taking um, TNF inhibitors for what was mostly inflammatory bowel disease, 91%. Mean age uh, that they had their report of paradoxical psoriasis was about 14 years. Um, All of them did not have a uh, history of psoriasis, but 40% did have a family history of psoriasis. Two-thirds of them presented with scalp psoriasis, which seems to be different than the adults, which is a lot of uh, pustular psoriasis. Um, And the onset of the psoriasis as a paradoxical reaction occurred at a median of almost 15 months after starting the TNF inhibitor. So it takes a while. It's not not something that happens right away. Um, These people were treated with a lot of different drugs, topicals, um, and then including systemic therapies and methotrexate and steroids and even a few days of thioprine, a quarter stopped their initial TNF inhibitor and changed to another second TNF inhibitor um, with improvement in the vast majority. So that seems to be something I think a little at odds with what I've seen. Um, persistent skin disease was seen in about only 17% and led to discontinuation of TNF inhibitors in a small minority. 
So again, this is a little bit different profile in kids with mostly IBD getting TNF inhibitors to develop paradoxical psoriasis. It gives great hope that you could stop and switch and maybe get control. This is different than another study of um, 2,800 RA patients and 5,300 sp spondyloarthritis patients. Amongst this group, very large cohort of patients, only 1.7% had paradoxical reactions occurring at a median, again, of, of 12 months after the TNF inhibitor, as was reported previously with other um, paradoxical reactions. Most of these were pustular, 60%, or palmal plantar, 31%. Those are difficult to treat and often need to actually stop the drug. 73%, however, were able to favorably switch to another TNF inhibitor. 46% went to a non-TNF inhibitor. Um, uh, oh, sorry, 46% went to a 73% switched. 43% to a non-TNF inhibitor. A non, sorry, an other, boy, I'm really screwing this up, aren't I? 73%, third try. I'm going to get it. I'm not going to re-record this. You're sticking with me because you want to know how many times he's going to screw this up. 73% favorably switched, 46% to another TNF inhibitor, and 27% to a non-TNF inhibitor, so another biologic. Uh, these patients were generally on background DMARDs, and these events were more likely to be seen in smokers. Maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. You know, we talked about a year or so ago, maybe, I think it was two years ago, about the Titan study, secukinumab in giant cell arteritis. Finally got published um, last Friday, uh, a phase two trial of only, what was it, 50 or so patients? Oh, where's the data? I don't have the data here, but it was a, a favorable report um, showing that secukinumab was superior to placebo in treating patients who had refractory disease despite steroids with gi active giant cell arteritis. Another interesting report, but this was only a small study of 15 cases, was belimumab in adults with in inflammatory myositis. So these patients received at least five doses of belimumab, that's given monthly, and treatment success, the, a score uh, greater than 40, was seen um, more commonly with belimumab um, than whatever was compared to, I guess placebo. And this was an also def a definition of a clinical improvement, DOI, 33 versus 17%. Um, while the results were numerically higher with belimumab than placebo, they were not statistically significant, but I think these results are interesting and probably merit further study in a controlled, larger, um, better done study. Uh, a little bit about scleroderma this week, a Taiwan claims analysis of uh, 1,830 uh, systemic sclerosis patients and almost 28,000 controls showed that systemic sclerosis patients were more likely to be hospitalized with heart failure than were controls. And this was a, a cumulative increase at 3, 5, and 10 years of 3.5%, 5.3%, and at 10 years, 9.7%. And that was higher than the um, age sex match comparator. So the odds of a patient with systemic sclerosis having hospitalizable heart failure was 3.3 times higher. Uh, another really interesting report, I think this was in JAMA Dermatology, was on scleroderma sine scleroderma. So they call these um, systemic sclerosis sine scleroderma. Um, in over 4,000 patients followed, 8.8% manifest this particular variant, which is defined as having no skin thickening. Um, and then he compared this subset to eight or 700 patients who had limited scleroderma and more diffuse forms of scleroderma. What did they find? That the patients who had systemic sclerosis sine scleroderma had better 15-year survivals than the other groups, 92% with sine scleroderma, limited disease, 69%, and diffuse disease, 55%. These were significant numbers. The, the sine scleroderma patients had a lower prevalence of digital ulcers and puffy fingers, maybe half the incidence. Skin telangiectasias in this group were associated with diastolic dysfunction with an odds ratio that was highly significant at 4.8. The sine scleroderma patients had less ILD than did, and had the same, that was the same amount as the limited, about half the patients, but this was inferior to the diffuse patients, as you know, or a greater risk of um, interstitial lung disease. 
And then lastly, skin fibrosis in this subset of systemic sclerosis sine scleroderma was associated with anti-SEL70 antibody positivity with an odds ratio of 3.0. So about 10% of all their patients in this large cohort, it's from the USTAR study, had this variant, really novel variant, um, and that although these patients you would think may because they don't have you know, the diffuse disease, the skin disease, they have a fair amount of interstitial lung disease greater four, than 40%, and even renal crisis at almost 3%. You know, I've seen a number of these patients over my career. I, I think my first few cases were about, were manifest as um, GI scleroderma without cutaneous scleroderma. Uh, and they were difficult to manage. So this is a, I still think this is a fairly scary subset, and that's how we titled it in the report. This week, we had another report of BMI and obesity being associated with arthritis risk. This was a UK biobank cohort of over 300,000 individuals. And they identified basically about what looks like a 30, 40, 50, 80% increase risk of developing RA, osteoarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, gout, and inflammatory spondylitis, eye closing spondylitis. So I can kind of explain the osteoarthritis and obesity, right? Makes sense. Obesity and gout, that kind of takes care of itself. But obesity and RA and AS and PSA, that's been reported before. So it looks like there may be different mechanisms by which osteoarthritis contributes to the risk of osteoarthritis, and which is a non-inflammatory variant, crystal arthritis, gout, and then inflammatory arthropathies. Nonetheless, it's a modifiable risk factor that we should be strongly lobbying against or to manage, I should say. Uh, oh, here's the data on the Titan study. 52 patients were enrolled. Um, discontinuations were half with secukinumab, only four versus eight with placebo. And the primary endpoint was sustained remission at week 28. This was seen with 70% on secukinumab and only 20% on placebo. We would assume that other larger, better done studies are going to ensue as far as the Titan study. That's it for this week on the podcast. Tune in next week for more great news in rheumatology. Take care of yourselves.